I want you to go to 1 John, the fourth chapter. 1 John. 1 John, the fourth chapter. Let's start with verse 15. 1 John, fourth chapter. All these that are standing, I don't know if downstairs is filled or not. We have closed circuit television downstairs uh, in the lower rotunda. Uh, if you just go down there, I don't know if those seats are all filled or not. Ushers, I see a few seats still. Uh, fill them up for those who are standing. If you have something on your seat, please remove it and put it under your seat except your purse, your Times Square. Don't put your purse anywhere but on your lap. Lord bless you. And uh, you can see downstairs on closed circuit television. Beginning to read verse 15, whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. We have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. How many believe that? God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is so are we in the world, in this world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath, what, torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. We'll stop reading right there. Lord, I thank you for your precious word. Now come forth with unction and anointing. Oh, God, don't let anybody leave this place unmoved and unchanged. God, put the sword deep, thrust it to the very marrow of the bone, then pour in the oil of healing. Oh, God, sanctify us and deliver us from our fears. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Now, it's God's own testimony from the word we've just read that fear is tormenting. It really means that fear is torturous. Fear is painful. It's excruciating. It's anguishing, both to your mind and your body and your soul. Folks, look at me, please. I, I am convinced that there is more fear among Christians today than in any other generation in history. Multitudes of Christians live in constant fear. It's so sad to see so many young converts get started so right, they're happy and contented in Christ for a season, and then suddenly they become overwhelmed with fear, and they spend most of their Christian life living in constant fear. They're overcome by a spirit of fear. Now, the Holy Ghost has sent me on a mission this morning, and I know it as sure as I know my name. I was mandated by the Holy Ghost to come before this body this morning and confront your fears and ask God by his holy word and the light of the gospel to drive those fears far from you, that when you walk out of here tonight, this morning, you will be absolutely free of all fear. We're going to expose some of these fears this morning and then take authority in Jesus' name. You can sit here this morning and say, well, I, I love the Lord. I pray, I seek God, I'm passionately in love with Jesus, but you suffer from some kind of tormenting fear. David once testified, I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and he delivered me from all my fears. Now, David had gone through a tough time, went to the Lord, and it's a wonderful testimony. God has delivered me from all my fears. So David lived happy ever after, didn't he? Never had any more fears. No. It wasn't long after that when David was cast into a horrible pit of fear and despair. I want you to go to Psalm 55 and read about it with me, please. Psalm 55. Very powerful uh, experience that we can learn from this morning dealing with our fears. 55th chapter of Psalm. Psalms 55. I'm going to start reading at verse 1 and let's read through verse 5. Do you have it? Give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not thyself from my supplication. Attend unto me and hear me. I mourn in my complaint and make a noise because of the voice of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they cast iniquity upon me, and in wrath they hate me. My heart is sore pain within me, and the terrors of death are fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling are come upon me, and horror hath overwhelmed me. This is the same man who testified that he had prayed and sought the Lord and God had delivered from all his fears. Look at me, folks. This battle against fear is a lifetime warfare. There is never going to be a time that, that you are going to be exempt from fear. 
That doesn't mean that you live every day in fear. There is deliverance, and we're going to be delivered this morning. But don't be surprised when it comes from some unexpected source and you're suddenly cast into another experience of trembling and fearfulness such as David is describing here in this 55th chapter of Psalm. Now, I want you to know that as far as I'm concerned and the Bible is concerned, all darkness is expelled by the light. You shine the light, the darkness flees, according to the scripture. Let's look at this and see if we can get some light in this dark corner of fear. One of, I'm going to give you some of the causes, I believe, of the fear that lingers in our spirits. The first cause, I believe, of fear in many Christians is the taunting, accusing voice of the enemy. The taunting, teasing, accusing voice of the enemy. Look at verse uh, 3. Psalm 55, verse 3. Because of the voice of the enemy... Because of the oppression of the wicked, for they've cast iniquity upon me, and in wrath they hate me. In the original Hebrew, David says, verse 3, They charge me with wickedness, they violently accuse me with malicious slander. Now David is going through a period in his uh, kingship where certain people have risen up in Israel, in Judah, and they're going about the walls, spreading strife, they're going everywhere, Casting, casting all kinds of questions and gossip and slanderous reports against his name. The Bible says, Paul said, or David said, because they oppress the wicked, they cast iniquity upon me, and in wrath they hate me. My, my heart is sore pain within me, and the terrors of death are fallen upon me. Satan rose up against David and possessed the hearts of those that were nearest him. In fact, David, before this is over, names the ringleader of it. He knows who's causing his fearfulness and pain. But it is spread throughout his kingdom now. And these vicious words of wrath and hatred were coming forth from an evil spirit that had come upon those that David least expected would be capable of such things. There was a movie a number of years ago. I didn't see it. It was called The Exorcist. And they had a radio advertisement. I'm sure they did on television, but I, I didn't have television. I was driving down the road one day, and they had an advertisement for The Exorcist movie. And it's about a young girl that was possessed of the devil, and the devil would speak. And they, they in the advertisement, this guttural voice came forth from this girl. And it was horrible, guttural sound of a, a deep a uh, man's voice that sounded like uh, just thunder out of hell. And this was supposedly the voice of the devil having possessed this little girl. But folks, that's not how the devil speaks. That's not how he speaks. He, he uses the voice of human beings. He takes the minds and the hearts of human beings and he speaks sometimes so tenderly, so sweetly, in fact, David said those enemies of his, the voice of the enemy that came against him was smoother than butter and softer than oil. Well, read it there. Verse 21. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet were they drawn swords. And in the Hebrew, it means that it, it, when it says smoother than butter, it means a, a, a voice uh, a slander of half-truths mixed with flattery. And when it says uh, softer than oil, it means spoken with false tenderness. And here's what was appalling David. Here is what was the cause of the fearfulness and trembling. He, he said, I can't fight this. I can't do anything about it because there's an enemy that's risen and they are speaking against me in slander and they flatter me while they poison me. And not only that, they are telling people that I am so concerned about David and it's coming forth as soft as oil and it's mixed with the false tenderness. We are only concerned about David for his own good. And David is appalled. He said, how do I fight that? How do I answer people who come in such sweetness and such tenderness and they speak a mixture of flattery and half-truths? And this is what he's talking about in verse 21. David said, this is so terrifying to me because people believe that when it sounds 
as though someone is coming forth with such concern on my behalf when David said they don't know that they, these people are out to absolutely destroy the kingdom. David went before the Lord and he mourned with grief and he went about his work with an aching heart. It was not just because there was an enemy speaking half-truths and lies and slander about him. It was not just that. It was the ringleader behind it. It was the people. It was, the, and finally he boils it down to one single individual who was the perpetrator of all of this. I want you to look at, uh, if you will, at verse 10, 11, it says, they were going about the walls, causing strife, spreading mischief and sorrow. Now, who is it that David's talking about that is speaking smoother than butter and words softer than oil, but they were poisonous slander that could destroy David and the kingdom? And it caused him fearfulness and trembling. Now, David wasn't afraid of the slander. David wasn't afraid of gossip. He wasn't afraid of the people. But there was a dread in his bosom. He was dreading because he said, this is so unnecessary and it's caused my body such pain. There's no need for my to have to be destroyed like this. Absolutely unnecessary. And most Bible scholars believe that David is referring to his dear counselor, Hithophil. And Hithophil was his very best friend. And Hithophil sat with him for days and weeks. They talked about the things of God. They discussed the work of the kingdom. Hithophil was a very wise man. He sat with him at table. He put his feet under the same table with David. And Hithophel saw the blessing of God on David. He marveled that, and the scripture says, everywhere David turned, the Lord was with him. The Lord blessed everything that he touched. There was something about David. And Hithophel saw the workings. And David exposed his heart. In fact, David said, if I had known what was in this man, if I had known he was going to turn against me. David said, I would have hidden my heart. I would have not, I would have not exposed myself and my deepest feelings to this man because now a hit the field is in a, in a whole group of rebellious people and a hit the field is now Absalom's advisor. He runs from David, knowing David's secret heart and going with Absalom who has risen up against his own flesh and blood. Now David's got his own flesh and blood against him, trying to destroy him. And now the greatest wound of all, his dearest friend, his dearest counselor, Hitherville, has suddenly turned against David and not only turned against David, rather than go quietly and just fade away, he goes to the enemy camp and he begins to build opposition against David all through Judah, turned all of Israel against David to Ahithophel. And here is David absolutely fearful and trembling are come be upon me and horror hath overwhelmed me. And he said, all oh, that I had wings like a dove, but then I would fly away and be at rest. I would wander far off and remain in the wilderness. I would escape this storm. And David, I think, is thinking about his shepherd days. Those nice, quiet days when he could just play his harp and, 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 and write songs and pet, pet the sheep. And once in a while, lie in a bear, but that was nothing to David. It was the solitude, and I believe David was yearning again. I think David said, I wish I didn't know, know anybody. I don't want all of this. It's been pain ever since I've been through it. Oh, if I could just go back and be an unknown shepherd. How many have ever wanted to escape a storm? You say, well, Brother Wilkerson, are you talking about yourself? Are you talking about me? I'm talking about all of us. Let me, I want to tell you something. Now listen, I'm going to make a statement and hear it in your spirit. The greatest enemy to a spiritual man or a spiritual woman is a carnal Christian. The greatest enemy is not on the street, not a drug addict, not a gambler, not some gossiper on the street. The greatest enemy to a man or woman who is wholly given to God, who walks pure and holy before the Lord, who has the favor and blessing of God. The greatest enemy is a carnal Christian who won't pay the price. And they see the blessing and favor of God on your life. They can be your best friend. They can be a husband. It can be a wife. It can be a co-worker, but because the hand of God is on you and you are blessed and favored, a jealous spirit will arise. It will turn to envy. It will turn to hate. And they will be your biggest enemies. Did you hear what I said? 
the greatest enemy to the godly person is a carnal Christian who can't pay the price, who won't seek God with all their heart, who won't lay down certain things in their life, and because their life is not in order, but this man's life is in order because he walks with God, because the blessings of God are on this individual, that rage comes up, and that's exactly what happened to Ahithophel. He was envious of David's orderly life, envious that everywhere David turned, even God turned his mistakes into blessings. And he hit the field saying, I've got all this wisdom, I have all this knowledge, and nothing goes right for me. I'm going to ask you some questions. What awful thing has a voice of the enemy done to you? Did the devil come into your house, move upon someone who's close to you and lashing out against you now with lies and half-truths? I just got a letter before the service from a lady just read it a moment ago. Her, her, uh, the sister, you don't, I'm not going to give your secret away or anything, but she's grieving because her husband left a number of years ago, <clears throat> fled off to another country and married somebody else, which is really bigamy. And she's lived six years with, with, with this terrible agony in her heart and a man who has absolutely misused her and abused her all these years and now going off seeming to have his own way. What about someone close to you, someone you trusted, someone who appeared so sweet, so caring? And David said, we had sweet fellowship. Did someone hate turn on you and begin to hate you and talk about you? Has Satan possessed someone on your job, someone you thought was your friend, and they see God's favor on you, they see God's blessing, they see you rejoice in trouble, and that envy comes up, and now they are your worst enemy, they come against you, you can't believe it, you hate to get up and go to work. Now, I don't know who it is, but God's made it very clear to me that there were many people that were going to be here this morning that are going through a horrible time just like David because someone you trusted somewhere, someone has been speaking against you. There has been gossip. There's been something coming against you. It could be in your home. can be your children, on your job. It can be another Christian in this church. God help it if it is. What do you do about that? There is fear, there's trembling, there's dread. Terrible, that's exactly what David's talking about. And I'm telling you, if there's a fear in your heart, if you are afraid of men, God can deal with that this morning in a marvelous way. You can quickly get delivered from that. Listen to what David says in verse 15. Let death seize upon them, let them go down quick into the hell, for wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. You know, it was only months later that it hit the field committed suicide. You, you can't touch God's anointed. You cannot touch God's anointed without paying the price. But as for me, see, he says, I'm not going to take vengeance. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. As for me, I'll call upon God and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and noon, I'll pray and I'll cry aloud. He shall hear my voice. He hath delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me, for there were many with me. Hallelujah. Look at verse uh, 20, God shall hear and afflict them, even he that abideth old, because they have no changes, therefore they fear not God. 22, verse 22, cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved, but thou, O God, shall bring them down into the pit of destruction. Blood and deceitful men shall not live out half their days, but I will trust in thee. And folks, listen to me. There's, there's a story in 2 Samuel, it's a very frightening story. Saul is on Mount Gilboa. He's just been defeated. He's been stricken with an arrow, evidently, but he has an armor on, and he can't kill himself because he can't get to his body. Uh, he can't get to, to uh, his backside. Uh, he has an armor on, and he, he knows he's dying, so there's an Amalekite passing by, and he turns to the Amalekite and he said, Slay me because I am already bleeding. I want you to kill me. David doesn't know anything about it, but the Amalekite, having slain Saul and had taken his crown and his bracelet, his kingly bracelet, approaches David. They bring the Amalekite to David. And and David said, what are you doing? You know, he, he saw the 
crown and he saw the kingly bracelet and he said, how do you know Saul is dead? He said, well, I killed him. He asked me to. And David rips off his outer garments and he calls all his soldiers together in his army and he mourn and grieve and weep for the whole day because of God's anointed Saul who, who was dead and his son Jonathan. And then in the evening, he calls the Amalekite to him and he says, I have a question for you. How is it that you were not afraid to destroy God's anointed? How was it? How is it that you were not afraid to destroy God's anointed? Folks, when I read that, a knife went through my soul because David would listen to no answers. God would have no excuses. The Malachite could have said, well, I'm just an innocent bystander. I just did what I was told. It's not my fault. There was no excuse before a holy God. And at the spot, the very spot, he was executed by the sword. And I'm telling you, this word of God says you cannot touch God's anointed. You cannot lift a finger. You can't lift a tongue against God's anointed. Saul was a madman at the time, but David, David said, this man is anointed of God. The callings of God are without repentance. The gifts of God are not taken back. He said, that's God's anointed. How could you not be afraid? And folks, that's what I don't know. I don't care what church you're from. You can be from a church in Ohio, California, uh, Europe. You may not like what your pastor's doing. You may not like what some of your leaders are doing. But God help you if you don't have the fear of God in you and you can sit around and talk and slander and cause grief to your leaders. The Bible says, how is it that you're not afraid to do that? What kind of Christianity? Have you not been listening to the word? Do you not know that this word is anointed? And every time you break it, you're destroying the anointed. You're touching the anointed. Touch not my anointed, do my prophets no harm. Don't touch them. I'm going to ask some of you, why have you not been afraid? Where has the fear of God been that you can listen or talk about any other Christian, anyone touched or anointed by God? How is it that you had no fear? And I tell you, you will be slain by the sword. This sword itself will slay you. Tragic. That's exactly what David said. Oh, God, thou shalt bring them down to the pit of destruction. Blood and deceitful men will not live out half their days, but I will trust in thee. Now, that's one fear. We're, we're going to talk about how to get deliverances before I close. We're going to talk about a second kind of fear. That's a misapprehension that God is angry with you. A misapprehension about the love of God. Majority of Christians today are living far beneath their privileges. Well, folks, God never intended that we live as we are living today, not living in the absolute sense of security in Christ Jesus, always fearing losing salvation, losing our place in God. There are so many Christians when they sin or when they fail God, they can hardly find their way back to grace and mercy. They can hardly find their way back because they live with such overwhelming fear and guilt and torment. Some of you sit here now with a fear that God is mad at you. You have a fear that you can never please God. You try so hard and you want to be right. You want to be pleasing to the Lord, but you live with this fear, this misapprehension that God somehow is angry with you, that, that he, he sees how weak you are. And that as much as you try, you can't seem to get victory over certain things in your life. And because you can't, this fear sets in. Why try? Why go any further? He that feareth is not made perfect in love. He says you don't appropriate or understand what God thinks of you. It's not now what you think of God or what you think of the blood, but what God thinks of you and what God thinks of the blood of his own son. Now, I want you to hear me. And, and put on your spiritual thinking cap, and I want you to hear me now. God is a perfect God. Christ is a perfect Savior. Heaven is a perfect place where only perfect people go. Nothing imperfect is going to get into the, into the paradise of God. Nothing imperfect. You have to be absolutely perfect to be saved and go to heaven. 
It doesn't mean you're perfect here, but absolute perfection alone gets into heaven. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. How long do you think it's going to take you to get perfect? 10 years, 20 years, 50 years? Uh, tell me what you're going to do to be perfect. What steps are you going to take to please God? I said, well, I, I won't go to any more movies. I, I'm not going to smoke. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to use drugs. I'm not going to look with lustful eyes. And I'm going to keep chopping away and chopping away till I can say with Saul or Paul, I have kept the law explicitly. I will do everything God tells me and somehow... Maybe God will give me 90% for trying. Surely trying counts for something. I'm telling you right now, it accounts for nothing, if in the flesh. There is only one perfect man. He came to this earth as God perfect. He came as man and lived perfect. And he was crucified perfect. He was buried as a perfect man. And he was raised as a perfect man. And that perfect man is before the throne of God. We have a man in glory who is perfect. And God looks on his son. God looks on his son as the only man who can stand before him from now on. He took the atonement of his own blood. Fully satisfied the justice of God. The demands of the law. Fully satisfied. And now he goes to the father with his own blood, but before he was ascended to the Father, he gathered up every believer in himself, and we in his own heart went with him to glory, and we with Christ are seated at the right hand of the Father. Perfect. Perfect. I am perfected under the blood of Jesus Christ. God only deals with one man. He doesn't deal with that old man. The old man is not transformed. The old man is not redeemed. The old man is done away with. He is crucified, dead, buried, gone. God, God doesn't deal with him. You, you say, well, I'm going to deal with God with the old man. God said, I'm going to do with him. He's dead and gone. I deal with Christ. I deal with my son. Folks, it's a leap of faith. It's saying, oh, God, I can never. I have no plea. Folks, when you stand before The judgment seat. What are you going to plead? Oh, folks, when I pray in my secret closet, all I do, I I walk around and say, Oh, Lord, I have no plea. Nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood. No goodness in me. No righteousness in me. Nothing that I can give to you. I give you the blood. I give you Jesus. My faith, my confidence in him. I am perfected in Jesus Christ. When you walk in faith in Christ, Gee, God, my Father says that I am accepted in the Beloved. Fully accepted. God is not mad at me. He's not mad at you when you fully trust in the redemptive, redemptive work of Jesus Christ that he finished the work that God said, I'm satisfied. All who are in Christ Jesus, there's one man, there is one body, and that's the body of Jesus Christ. He's the head, we are the arms, the feet, the eyes. We are his body. And right now, if you'll appropriate it, it's a step of faith. You and I are seated right now, positionally, before the Father, in full favor, full blessing, as he looks on his own son. Accepted in the beloved. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me ask you a question. Which sins did Jesus die for you? Your past? How many believe all your past sins are forgiven? Raise your hand. All your past sins are under the blood. How many believe your present sins are under the blood if you confess them? What about your future sins? The blood. See, it's not just what I see of the blood. It's what God sees of the blood. What God sees of the blood. Do you remember the blood being applied to the door post? Here, here's a family, and he just put the blood on the door, and his, his son comes to him and says, Father, are we safe tonight? Am I going to live? I'm the firstborn. He said, oh, yes, you're going to live. <clears throat> the 
blood's on the door. Next door, there's a man who's applied the blood to the door. And uh, his firstborn says, Daddy, am I going to live through the night? He says, oh, I hope so. Son, I hope so. And he holds on to him and full of anxiety. There's fear in his heart. Let me ask you a question. Over here is a man who's fully trusting in the and over here is another. These are types of Christians because they were Israelites. And this man over here is full of anxiety and trepidation. Which one of those houses are safest? They're both safe. Because the blood's on the door. Folks, at times you don't understand. Sometimes the devil try to bring fear. He'll bring condemnation and guilt and everything else. You stand up and say, I believe in the blood of Jesus Christ. I believe I'm safe. <laughs> Paul preached like that and his enemies came and said, you preach like that and people will take his excuse to sin. No, folks, when you see how secure you are in Christ and when you believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ, he wants that to cast out all fear. He wants you to know that he loved you. He loved you, so he sent his son to die for you. Folks, God's in the business of reconciliation and redemption. That's his work. That's the work of Jesus Christ. That's the work of the church of Jesus Christ. And folks, because of that, because I know I'm secure in the Lord, the Holy Ghost comes upon me and empowers me to live for him and convicts me of my sin. And I run quickly to the Father. I run quickly to the blood of Jesus Christ. And he gives me power. And then when I realize what Jesus has done, suddenly I realize that sin is losing its grip. It's losing its dominion over me. I'm no longer bent towards sin. I'm bent toward my place in Christ. And I follow that bent of my spirit. Hallelujah. I'm just touching on it. But folks, I want you to know, the Lord wants you to know security in his work. Hallelujah. Some of you constantly living in fear that you're not going to make it. That God somehow, after all this struggle and everything else, is going to cast you aside. Not if you look to him who has paid the price in full. Hallelujah. In closing, I want to... <clears throat> Ephesians 1, 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Are you accepted right now before God? Even with your fears? Even with your faults? You go to him and say, oh, Jesus, I believe in the power of your blood. Cleanse me. Sanctify me by the blood. Hallelujah. Finally, there's a, a, a fear about the things that are soon to come upon the earth, things that are coming upon the earth. Men's hearts fading them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. The scripture says, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Folks, look at me, please. There's a, such tormenting fear of the future sweeping over America, especially right now. A shaking has begun that's been prophesied in the Bible. Everything to be shaken is now shaking. People are losing their jobs. Others are wondering about where they're going to live, how they're going to pay their rent, how they're going to survive, how they're going to eat. I ask you, how many locks do you have on your door if you live here in New York? I got four on mine. What about fear in the classroom of your children? The school. Schools are war zones now. There's fear in the streets. Buildings are being blown up. Random shootings. It goes on and on. And this fear touches every area of our life now. There's, there's, there's hardly any place you can go without this fear. You get on subways, on buses. And uh, did you hear about the taxi cab driver? Uh, someone jumps in and demands he drives him to Detroit. He races to Detroit. Man gets out. He's in the house five minutes says, take me back. The bill was $3,000. And the man skipped away, didn't pay a dime. And uh, they finally found him and asked him why he went to Detroit. He said, I just went to get my checkbook. There's such stupidity. 
such, uh, but, but you see, these things happen every day now. Things that are mind boggling, producing all kinds of fear. And you know what most parents fear and grandparents fear? They say, well, I've just about lived out my day. Some of you, if you're in your 60s, 70s, you say, well, I, I'm getting closer to the coming of the Lord or my departure. And you, you're concerned about your children and your grandchildren. What's it going to be like if it's so bad now? It is going to get horrendous. And oh, what fearful days there are ahead. But God is still in control, folks. He sees all these things coming. They're not hidden from the eyes of God. The calamities, the hardship, and the fearful things that are coming upon the earth. And men's hearts are failing them for fear, watching those things coming upon the earth. But the Lord, uh, he, he doesn't say, well, do your best. Get prepared to live in a fearful seed state of mind. He doesn't say that at all. He makes a demand of us as his people. He said, when you see all these things begin to happen, look up and rejoice because your redemption draweth nigh. You don't rejoice because over 200 people are blowing up in, in Oklahoma City. You don't rejoice because people are being killed and because there are fearful things that are happening all and calamities. You don't rejoice over that. You rejoice that these things signify that his coming is right at the door, that these are signs and and we we are to rejoice that his coming is inching closer and closer. Folks, to me, it's just like a thin tissue between time and eternity. And we're at the tissue. He's ready to just break the tissue. Hallelujah. I, I believe, if, let me tell you, before I close, what I think it might be like. One day, these kind of headlines. Satellites show strange fires bursting out in the heavens. And I say, so what? I'm out of here anyhow very soon. <laughs> Headline number two. Scientists baffled at huge pillars of smoke spiraling down from the heavens. So, this world's not my home anyhow. It's time to get ready to go. Headline number three. Blood, fire, and vapors of smoke like a scroll in the cosmos are picked up by a telescope. So what? That's the last call. Jesus is getting his white horse ready. And we're about to hear the trumpet. Another headline, economy collapses. Wars breaking out everywhere. Race riots in every major city. Fires breaking out. Chaos. Men's hearts failing them. Men and women fleeing to the mountains and the caves to hide them in this troubled time. And our answer is so we rejoice because our next stop is paradise. Jesus is coming. These are all signs of the coming of the Lord. Hallelujah. He's coming soon. Folks, I believe these things are to wean God's people away from materialism. I sure wouldn't want to be preaching prosperity when all this comes down. I wouldn't want to be there. There are going to be a lot of people say, why weren't we warned? Why weren't we told? Folks, we've been warned in this church. All right, you have fear. You have fear of man. You have fear of the future. You have fear of losing your place in God or the favor of God. There's only one solution. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Hallelujah. Looking unto Jesus. Now, you're going to have to take authority over your fears. You're going to have to stand in Jesus' name in just a moment and say, I don't have to live in these fears. Because God said, I have not given you the spirit of fear, but love and power to sound mind. And I've always thought, if God didn't give it to me, I don't have to put up with it. It's from the enemy, or from my flesh, or from the devil. I don't have to endure it. Getting victory is an act of faith on your part. Where you said, I believe, if I call on the Lord and I look unto Jesus, he's going to see me through. He's going to take the fear of man out of my heart. I will not fear what man can do unto me. I will not look to man. I'll look to the Lord. And my faith shall rise that I am accepted in the beloved. I am totally accepted by Jesus, by the Father in Christ Jesus. And I will not fear for my job. I will not fear what I shall eat. The Bible says you're not even given a second thought about what you eat or what you're going to wear or where you're going to sleep. God says, I know you have need of these things. If God said, you just look at me. I'll take care of you. I'll take care of you. Let's stand, please.
Now, folks, I've only, I've only listed three kinds of fear this morning. I don't know what kind of fear that you're enduring right now, what kind of fear that's in your heart, but God wants to deliver you this morning. I know it. I know it. I know it. Folks, just be, please don't let it, no one leaving right now stand in reverence to his Holy Spirit. I know God put this in my heart. Yesterday in prayer, the Holy Spirit came upon me and, and told me clearly that there were people here that have to be delivered from your fears because if you don't get deliverance now, you're going to go through a long, hard, dark night of despair because of your doubt. And you're going to live tormented. And God grieves when his children live with torment. Fear has torment. God does not want you to walk out of this church tormented, abused by fear. He wants to set your spirit and your mind free. We're going to take authority over that. And some of you have a spirit of fear that's on you. You've, you've tried to shake it off, but it's a spirit of fear. But we're going to take dominion in Christ's name and believe that you'll be delivered from your fears. If you're not right with God, if you have backslidden, you say, Brother Dave, I am not walking with Jesus as I should. I want you to get out of your seat. I want you to come and stand here right now. And those who need delivered from a spirit of fear, I want you to get out of your seat and come and join us. Up in the balcony, go to either stairs on either side, come down any aisle, and we'll meet you here. And please come in close. There's going to be a lot of people coming, so move in close if you will, please. We're going to believe the Lord this morning for absolute freedom and deliverance from the bondage and terror of fear. Hallelujah. Against us, they would have swallowed us up quick when the wrath was kindled against us. The waters had overwhelmed us. The stream had gone over our soul. The proud waters had gone over our soul. But blessed be the Lord who has not given us as a prey to their teeth. Our soul has escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken. We have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. The rod of the wicked shall not rest upon the lot of the righteous, lest the righteous put forth their hands to iniquity. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask you right now to believe God with me. I'm going to take authority in Jesus' name. He's called me as a shepherd, and as a shepherd, and as one of his anointed. I'm going to ask God to hear my cry this morning on your behalf, and I want you to join my prayer. And I want you to believe as I pray that you can be delivered from a spirit of fear. I'm talking about a spirit of fear. It's there all day long when you get up, when you go to sleep, and through the day it's a nagging, constant thing that keeps coming back. You, you don't want it, but it keeps coming back. You're going to have to believe God with me right now. I want you to believe the Lord's going to deliver you and set you free. If, it, if it's really upon you, raise both hands and, and, and agree with me right now. And folks, let's pray. There may be others in the congregation. You are bound by a spirit of fear, and God wants to break it. And I believe God's going to hear my cry. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, King of kings and Lord of lords, I speak your word. I come against this spirit of fear that has gripped the hearts and the minds of so many in this place this morning. And I speak your commanding word. And I command those spirits of fear to leave and depart these minds, these bodies in this house, this moment. Go your way. Go to outer darkness. Go wherever you please. But you cannot touch anymore. Release. Release the minds, the bodies, the spirit, the soul. Release this bondage. Say you have no power. You have no rights. You have no rights to these who claim the blood of Jesus protection of the blood of Christ. It is the blood of Jesus that prevailed against you, Satan. And we speak the power of the blood. We speak power of the blood. Oh, God, I believe you now to break the chains that bind. Break these chains. Cry out to God, Lord, set me free right now. Lord, I give you my fear. Lord, I give you my fear. I am going to be delivered this morning.
I lay my fear at your feet, oh God. Hallelujah. Break the chains now, Lord. Break the chains. Break every chain that binds. Hallelujah. I want you, I want you in your own words, everybody who came, I want you in your own words to confess everything that needs to be confessed and say, Jesus, I confess my sins. I confess everything I've done against you and I bring it to the blood. Jesus, I know that I'm received before the Father through Christ my Lord. Take a stand of faith right now and say, Lord, accept me in the beloved. Father, accept me in Christ. Accept me in the beloved because I come to the blood. Cleanse me. Purify me by the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Oh, glory be to God. Redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb. Now thank Him in your own words. Just give Him thanks. Lord, I thank You. I thank You. I praise you. I give you glory. I give you praise. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is the conclusion of the message.